to, to start off, well, there was a problem set just due just now at 1 o'clock. There's offici officially on the schedule, there's a, another problem set due next Wednesday. But realistically, I'm not going to get to material that I want to cover in time to make that problem set doable, the one I've got in mind. So you're the first, I'm not, I'm not going to have it. Okay, I mean, I know this, oh gosh, such, you're so disappointed that I, I so problem set six, I'm gonna, the sixth one I'll, I'll post one until after the test. You've got a test to prepare for anyway. anyway. I mean, they're good, it's, it's good news, bad news, it gives you, the problem sets are supposed to be preparing you for, for the test, but um, take the old exams to prepare for the, for the test. That's a, equivalently good. <sighs> it always happens that later in the semester I just, don't get the problem sets out or get the material in time for the problem sets and stuff. And so I've, I don't think I've gotten to 10 problem sets in a semester for many semesters. Ambition uh, fails. All right, so, so where things are, and I really want to finish up electric power distribution since we sort of have ended up accidentally majoring in that topic. Um, I'll, I'll finish off power, power distribution, and it's largely the story of transformers and um, associated with that are the, the interactions between electric and magnetic fields, which finally make transformers possible. And they make so many other things possible, particularly radio waves, which is the next topic, and I'll, or radio in general. And I'll, and, and I'll start radio today. But um, sort of getting at least a, a qualitative sense of what the heck is going on between electricity and magnetism and, and what these electric and magnetic fields are about is necessary to, to build into radio. So, what, 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 sorry, sorry. What, what I have done to date is, is uh, give you some idea of how a transformer works, but let me just finish the process. Uh, the transformer moves power from one circuit to another, and it does this electromagnetically. It does it by taking advantage of the relationship between, relationships between electric and magnetic fields, specifically the changing electric fields produce magnetic fields, and changing magnetic fields produce electric fields. These, actually, the, 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 the changing electric fields produce magnetic fields is a minor player in the story, but, most, but, the, but certainly the one that, that changing magnetic fields produce electric fields is crucial. So in any case, the ch change connects electricity and magnetism, I mean, sort of you know, in a one-liner. Uh, and so you can move power from one circuit to another when there's change going on. Why, why harp on that? It's because transformers don't work with direct current, or at least the simplest of the direct currents. If you connect a battery to, to one of the coils of a transformer, I remind you, a transformer consists of two coils of, of wire, at least, um, that share the same magnetic environment. In fact, the same electromagnetic environment. If you try to move power from one circuit to another, the two, the, those coils being parts of separate circuits, and it's, it's the, you're moving the power that's coming from a battery, you're in trouble. Why? Because, and here's, this is a, a drawing of, of a, uh, it's sort of a cartoonish drawing of a simple transformer. One coil, another coil, they share the same magnetic environment by virtue of being on the same chunk of iron, which conveys the magnetic, uh, the magnetization basically of, the, of one coil into the other coil. They, they're, they're magnetically overlapping, even though they're physically separated. Um, if this is one circuit, this is another circuit, no electrical connection between the two. If you build this, this cir first circuit, which consists of, the, of that first coil, which by, by convention is called the primary coil, if you connect this this up with a battery here instead of this object labeled AC. If you put a battery there, current will flow from the high voltage side of the battery through the coil to the low voltage side of the battery, be pumped again. You'll make a perfectly decent circuit, but it has no change going on. It will just carry current steadily second after second after second after you first connect. When you first connect it, there's a little change, but after that, it's just steady, no change. And so Nothing interesting will happen in, relationship, in the relationship between this coil and that coil. They won't interact because, yeah, they will share magnetism. This will be magnetic. It will magnetize the iron core, and this coil will have a, 
magnetic, a piece of a, a, a steadily magnetized chunk of iron passing through it, but that won't have any interesting effect on, the, on, on what's going on in that coil wire. Nothing fun will happen over here. Okay? You need the change. And so the reason we've got an AC power system, an alternating current electric power grid, is because we need change going on in this first coil. We need the current that goes through it not to be steady, but to be, but to be fluctuating. That fluctuation gives rise to a fluctuating magnetization of the core. So it's being magnetized first one way, in fact, and then the other, and back and forth, and back and forth, and changing magnetizations and magnetic stuff, changing stuff, produces electric fields. And those electric fields do two important things in this transformer. First, they, put, they, they push charge in the, in the wire of the secondary coil. That, the charges that are living inside that, say, say chunk of copper, are just, would, would just sit there doing nothing if it weren't for electric fields. But because the, magnet, the magnetization of that core is, 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 is whipping back and forth and back and forth, there is an electric field created by that changing magnetic field, and it pushes the charges in the secondary coil. It pushes them first one way and then the other as the, as the fluctuations keep reversing. So an alternating current shows up in this secondary coil. Or, or I should say first, an alternating voltage rise appears in that coil. The electric field pushes charge and piles the charge up at one end of the coil. And then it pushes charge the other way and push, piles the electric charge up in the other end of the coil, alternating back and forth. It's creating an alternating voltage difference between the two ends of the coil. And since there's a light bulb connected to, the, to, the, to those two wires, that alternating voltage difference pushes charge through the, through the light bulb and lights the light bulb up. So this becomes a source of electric power even though it has no battery in it. And it provides power to the light bulb. So you okay with that? I'm, I'm just, here just rattling along. Yeah, thanks. Woo, question, yay. In this particular drawing, it's a, it's a great question to remind me. That this is why questions are important, right? So, so Jesse's question is, why does the secondary circuit have a lower voltage than the, prim than the primary circuit? Because there are not very many turns in this coil. The convention is to, to refer to them as turns. I mean, it's long-standing convention in transformer land. This has very few turns, which means that there is an electric field here, but it doesn't have very far to push on the charges. It pushes them actually. It's a weird electric field because it, it goes around that chunk of iron. And it pushes the charges and they get moving and they begin to move, they, they begin to move in the direction they're pushed. So the electric field is doing work on them. They're moving in the direction you push them. So remember work, force times distance in the direction of the force? Like the, the electric field is doing work. But it's only got one, two, three turns around the magnetic field in which to do the work not very much distance. So the charges come out having accumulated a little bit of energy per charge, which is to say a little voltage. So, th so this, this device here, this secondary coil, have, because it has so few turns, develops a little voltage drop, uh, rise between entry and exit. A couple volts. And if you put more turns in that coil, you'd get a bigger voltage rise. And you can do that by flipping to the next view graph. There. If you put a zillions of turns in that coil, what do I have here? 300 turns instead of three. There's 100 times as much distance here to travel in the direction of the electric field. And the charges accumulate, each, each charge accumulates 100 times as much energy. So the voltage rise in that, that many turn coil is much bigger. Yes? Say, say. Ah, in both cases, are, are the number of charges passing the same? And the answer is no. And to, this is another good question. And, and to, 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 to show you why, let me go back to the previous one just because I can, I, I can draw the, I can see the, see the turns better. There's a question I'm not going to There's a second effect of that electric, there is a second effect of that electric field. It's produced, the changing magnetization of this core is producing electric field. That, that, that was the start. That electric field does positive work on the charges in the secondary coil, and it does negative work on the charges in the primary coil. 
it, ha it affects the charges in the primary coil. So this primary coil is carrying current first one way and then the other, and magnetizing the iron first one way and the other. But that magnet magnetizing the iron first one way and back and forth, that, that in turn affects the charges in the current. It's a weird, it, the charges in the current get, get they, they do something, they magnetize the system, and that something does, comes back at them and, and pushes on them and sucks energy out of them. Right, because they're living in the same electromagnetic environment as the secondary coil. If, 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 the, if the electric field does something to these charges, it ought to do something to these charges, and it does. And what happens is, whatever energy, uh, it, or actually, power is a better word, whatever power is, 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 is uh, uh, developed in this coil and used to power that light bulb, that power is extracted from the current in the, in the primary coil. Energy is conserved. Th there's a back, uh, there's a name for this, back induction. Yeah, it's a name that escapes me at the moment. But, but the, all the energy that's, or power that's being sucked out of the, pri of the secondary coil is extracted from the current in the primary coil, okay? So if you allow one ampere of current to go through this with, a t with its little dinky voltage rise, well, what did I say, 12 volts, um, it's going to extract, if it's one ampere of current, it's going to extract 12, volt, 12, amp, 12 watts of power. It's going to suck 12 watts of power out of the current in the, in the primary coil. Uh, if you go to the, ne the next one, this, this, this crazy many, 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 many turn secondary coil, in this case, if there was one ampere of current going through that, it would do, uh, provide 12,000 watts to that neon sign. It would suck a huge amount of energy out of, this, out of the prim primary. It needs 12,000 watts. And that would mean, uh, yeah, the, I, what I don't want to do is get too much into the details of the current flowing in the primary. But the, the energy, the, uh, so this transform would, would suddenly need to draw a whole lot more energy out of the primary circuit in the power company. You don't get something for nothing. You know, the, the, the physics works out, the na nature. So that means that the more turns you have in this coil, either you're going to be drawing more, more power from the, the power, power company to, to deliver the same current at a higher voltage, in the second, or you're going to have to, the, the current's going to be less. So typically in transformers, Along with this, this transform being a step-up transformer, providing its secondary provides a very big voltage rise, it typically handles only a little current. Why? Partly how the, how the thing's structured and the wires are thin, but partly because if it, if it delivered a large current at that, at, at that giant uh, voltage rise, which is possible, it would be a very high-powered transformer. It would be drawing a huge amount of power from the power company. And this guy, you know, as I flip back, Across that question, this guy can draw a lot of current without extracting very much power from the power company. So it typically, these are typically high, high current transformers. High current, low voltage. You sort of get one or the other. You get high current, low voltage, or you get high voltage, low current. If the product of those two gets too big, now you've got a very high power transformer. It's moving a lot of power. And it's possible, but not, uh, it involves bigger structures and stuff. Is that, is that sort of okay? Um, you know, how does, how does the transformer make this all work out? It, it turns out uh, that since the electric field here, electric field that's produced by the changing magnetic field is affecting both coils, there, it, 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 it develops, the electric field develops to the, to the strength at which it becomes, it increases in strength until it perfectly uh, extracts all of the energy from the, from the charges entering it, it extracts them electromagnetically rather than by then turning them into thermal energy. It, it, it pushes the charges backwards and slows them down and enter, you know, lowers them energy, and it delivers them out the other end of the wire, the other end of the coil, having had all their energy sucked out. And it, 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 it sends them back to the power company at low energy. So this, this, this coil doesn't get hot in principle. It, the current going through, through it loses energy not to heat, but to the electric field 
that's present in the transformer and that is also serving to add energy to the charges in the secondary coil. They're grace, the charges basically are gracefully, uh, uh, energy is gracefully taken out of the charges and they leave with less energy than they arrived, having transferred their energy amazingly through the electromagnetic system into the other current. And that's about as clean as, I, as I've managed to say it. Um, and the, the, the fact that the two coils, in this case they have different voltages because of the different number of turns, uh, as, uh, yeah, they have different voltages because of di different number of turns. If they had uh, the same number of turns in the primaries and the secondary, the secondary would be, become a source of electric power at the same voltage that is delivered to the primary. So this is a 120 volt circuit. This would be a 120 volt circuit if they had the same turns. Uh, what else is true about this situation? Um, there, there's, a, there's a beautiful magnetic cancellation in there between the, the, the magnetism of the, the two currents, but I'll leave that in the book. It's, you know, it's one of those, as, a, as, a, as an aside, people write physics texts and I've, I've noticed this, in my, certainly myself and other people, um, there's several audiences that we address you know, that's natural address. One of them is you all, which often gets set aside. The other one is other faculty, and the third is ourselves. So, so I write, I try to write with all you guys in mind, but I'm aware that, some, that there will be some experts reading the book that will go, that go like, well, he didn't do this right. And so, I, so I've got stuff in the book that are written, and they surely go over most of your heads. And I, and I can't help myself, in part because I'm writing, because I, I want to I guess I prove myself to some of the other faculty members who read it, um, somewhere else, whatever it is. And the other thing is I write for myself, because I say, it's so cool that there is this weird magnetic cancellation between the, two, the, cur the mag magnetic fields of the two Currents and those two, those two calls. It's so cool. I have to write about it. And again, it might, it might go right over your heads, but okay, you know, it's the, the problems of trying to write books. Okay? So, what should, what should you be aware of here that really power is moving from the left circuit to the right circuit by way of this electromagnetic interaction, which is itself complicated, and I hope you get some feel for it. Um, and that you can do weird things, like if you change the number of turns in the secondary coil, you can rebalance, you, you can change, you, you can shift the voltage in the second circuit. At the same time, you end up shifting the, changing the current. The, 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 if the voltage gets larger, the current typically gets smaller and vice versa um, in order to, to conserve the transfer of power. The, the power consumed by the primary, received by the primary, is handed off perfectly to the secondary. That's most of the story. Uh, any questions? Any other things you, you're wondering about? Having said that then, I can come back to the real, you know, where's this all going to? It's all going to the fact that you can move power around between circuits and therefore take advantage of different relationships between current and voltage that are appropriate for the, the current part of the electric power grid. Um, to remind you of the, of, the, the, the original problem, the original problem was this, that if you try to uh, provide power to a light bulb that's very nearby, things are easy. It's not, you know, no big deal. You can have a, a low voltage battery providing a large current to the light bulb. Uh, the light bulb extracts energy fr from this large current. Uh, it's a small voltage drop here, so each charge doesn't deliver very much energy, but there's so many charges, you get, you get plenty of energy, the light bulb lights up, it's happy. You gotta be a little careful with, I don't know what's connected down here, before I plug it in and blow something up. On the other hand, if you've got a very distant light bulb, and you have to provide power to it by way of a very long circuit, now you, you have some trouble. In this case, we're pushing charges into the wire at 12 volts, and they're fighting their way through that wire, which is not a very good conductor of electricity, and that requires a pretty uh, strong push, a pretty strong electric field. 
So you have to have a pretty big voltage drop in the wire to, to, to deliver the charges. So they, they leave here at 12 volts, but the, at, uh, the arrival is only maybe 9 volts. And they, it goes through the light bulb, and you can't let the voltage drop all the way to zero because you have to return the current back to the battery. So it, it comes out here maybe at 3 volts and returns, fights its way through the battery to, to down and arrives at 0 volts. So the result is there's only about 6 volts of voltage drop available to the light bulb filament. It doesn't glow very brightly. Any questions about the circuit? I mean, it's, sort of the, it's a basic issue in this whole story. So what are you going to do? Oh, this is really a problem. Well, the first thing you do is, is you can't work with a battery and transformers because the battery is a source of, of direct current. It will push current. You, you can connect it up in, in, as in a circuit with the primary of a transformer, but after a brief trans, transition where the current begins, uh, there will be no, no further change. The current will just run steadily through the primary of the transformer and will magnetize its iron, but nothing will change and no power will move from circuit to circuit. So the first thing we have to do is we have to switch over to an alternating current instead of a direct current. So instead of using a battery, I'm going to use now a transformer that provides, we should, I should just say, a source of alternating uh, electric power that can be described as having a 12 volt voltage drop. Is this wired up right? Yeah. Okay. Nothing seems to have changed, which is good. At this point, we're still able to light the local light bulb up nicely. The distant light bulb is still struggling. There's a problem still here. Uh, the situation is a little more complicated than it used to be. This, this whole structure here is sort of a secret. You don't really need to pay any attention to it. It's, it's just my way of getting hold of 12 volt alternating current instead of 12 volt direct current. What's, what's present on, at these two terminals here, with this all buried, I could put this in a box and hide it from you. What's present at those two terminals are, they, they have a voltage difference between them. And if it were a battery, from a battery, it would be 12 volts all the time. One would be, we could call it negative, or we could call it zero. And the other one we could call positive, or could, we could call it 12 volts. Same idea. It would just be sitting there all day. This source is weird. What it's got is it's got two terminals, and the voltage difference between them is, is alternating. It's going from, from uh, the left one being high voltage, whoosh, to the right one being high voltage, back and forth and back and forth. And it's, it's sinusoidal, it's following that, that trigonometric function as a function of time. Is that okay, to, questions so far? You might wonder, what does it look like? If it's doing this, if it's doing this trick up and down, um, there are some things to point out. There are moments when there's no power, right? Zero, zero, they're both at the same voltage, nothing's happening. And then there are moments when they're separated as widely as possible, and back and forth, and back and forth. How does that affect all of what's going on here? Well, it is totally true that the current in these wires and the light bulb filaments is weird. It's going first one way through the filament, and then slowing to a, in effect to a stop to, to truly zero. There's moments where there's no current flowing through those circuits, and then it reverses, goes back the other way. So the current in, you know, so one of those wires, pick one. This wire, the current's going shoom, that way, then back and forth and back and forth. And, and there are devices that see current flow, and they would watch it go back and forth. Is that okay? Uh, a, a little more about it. The voltage difference between these two terminals, since it's not 12 volts most of the time, and there are moments at which it's 12 volts, um, geez, uh, what actually is it? It turns out that. They're, okay, we start with the moments where, where they're equal, zero. One goes up, the other one goes down. How far apart do they get? Do they get 12 volts apart? No, they actually overshoot that. They go to 12 volts times the square root of 2. Okay, where, where did the square root of 2 show up from? It's, it's there. It's got to do with the time average of the square of the sine function. It's, which, it comes out of the square root of 2. It's, it's a messy thing. But the point is that the voltage difference between these two wires 
goes to more than 12 volts. It goes more to like 100, uh, it goes sort of to 17 volts. And then it goes back down to zero and goes to 70 volts. And why would it go beyond 12? Well, to get a time average behavior that's very, that tries to resemble a 12 volt average difference. Since you got times when there's no voltage difference, those are, those are loser moments. You got to go to winner moments where you've got more than 12 volts between the two. And the, 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 the sophisticated way of averaging it all out is this is this can be described as 12 volt electric power but it does involve voltages that go beyond 12 volts uh, that is true also the power coming from the outlets it's it's called 120 volts but it's an alternating current volt it's an alternating voltage it actually makes excursions to the, where the difference goes beyond 120 volts to about 170 volts so there are, if you grabbed in there at, the, at just the wrong moment, I would say the right moment, but it's the wrong one, you put your fingers in there, bam, there'd be 170 volts across your fingers. And then a little while later, you could do it again and get it another 170 volts, but they'd be inverted. Okay? The, the, the choice of how to describe the voltage and set it up is done so that this light bulb, which, run, which is an 80-watt light bulb, it obtains 80 watts from, from a 12 volt source. It also obtains an average, a time average of 80 watts from this source. It's pulsing a little bit. There are moments when this light bulb gets no, volt, no power, but there are moments when it gets more than 80 watts. And if you average over time, which is fine because this is a very fast fluctuation, uh, you get 80 watts on average. All right? So this is a source of, of 12 volt alternating electric power um, it has this funny excursions in voltage, but it delivers power to simple devices like light bulb filaments and toasters and hair dryers indistinguishably from 12 volts of direct current from a battery. Um, last thing I should say with that is that, that there are many simple devices. If you, if you go back 100 years, almost every device of, of, of import uh, was essentially unable to distinguish between 120 volts DC and 120 volts AC. They, they respond exactly the same. There's this fluctuating character to the AC stuff, but, who, but you wouldn't notice it. You wouldn't notice it from light bulbs. Um, you wouldn't notice it from toasters, from space heaters, from various simple things. They just, they just don't recognize the reversal of current. They don't care which way the current goes through them. Who, you know, it's dropping off energy, this is good. So a toaster can run off DC just as well as it can run off AC. As long, as long as the voltage is the same. All right? <sighs> Electronic devices, uh, like computers and stuff like that, uh, this is a mess for them. First off, uh, like a lot of electronic devices are very aware of time, even down to tiny fractions of time. And the moments in which there's no electric power present in an alternating current electric power system, the, those are nightmares for electronic devices. That's it's an eternity of no power as far as a computer chip is concerned. You know, they're, 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 the computer chip is, is, is doing things at the billionth of a second time scales. It's you know, adding and subtracting and moving stuff around in billionths of a second or sub billionths of a second. And the result is that period in which the power goes to zero, it, you know, it, 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 could, it, could, it could earn you a Bitcoin during that time. Okay? So it's like, Totally crazy amount of time. Um, so they need help. They need energy storage, which is another topic for the future. But the other thing is that most electronic devices are very aware which direction current is flowing. And if you send current through them this way, they work. And they send current through them that way, total disaster, nothing, nothing functional. So they, they have to undo the alternating nature of electric power to operate, and so your, all your computers and your, even your, the, little thing, the things you plug into the wall um, for your, to, to charge your laptop or stuff, they contain two things. One is, a, is, a, is a, a components that shift the voltage to the right, typically low voltage is necessary to operate your computers. They're getting 120 volt voltage drop alternating from the outlet. They have to work their way down to lower voltages. They want more current, less voltage, and they do that by way of surprising, you know, no big surprise, transformers. The other thing they have to do is they have to get rid of the, of the reversal stuff. And they do that by way of diodes and, and friends of diodes. Diodes are like light emitting diodes. I told you the other day they're, they're one-way devices for electric current. In, in diodes, that's sort of a, a, 
light emitting diodes, that's sort of a, a, a detail. They, they produce light, that's what you care about. But, but uh, the diodes associated with one-way devices, um, they're not about light. They're about trying to make sure the, the current always goes the same way. Uh, they're the one-way signs of, of electric world. Okay, so we're, we're still stuck. We've got an alternating current source, alternating electric power source, which that's okay, but it's not doing anything for us. We're still having trouble lighting the distant light bulb. So what do we do? If we take the electric power available here at, at, as a large current at low voltage, we move it, we move some of the power to a second circuit in which the voltage is high and the current is small. So we'll, we'll do that. Something is burning up here. That guy's burning up. Um, yeah, it's starting to smell. So you're like, wow, somebody's having lunch, and it's like really nasty. Okay. If I pass out, it's because of that. Now I've got to be a little careful about wiring this up. I'm going to wire the whole thing up, otherwise I will probably shock myself. How many? Uh, I'll do it like this. This ought to work. Do 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 do. So I'm built, building a system that that actually has three circuits. Right now, this is a, circuit with, a system with one circuit, the power source and the, going immediately to the light bulbs. The two light bulbs are operating in principle in parallel. They're sharing the same current. The current goes into this light bulb and comes back. But it also, part of the current also goes all the way across the room and to the lap, that light bulb and comes back. But it was just one circuit. I'm making now three circuits. And I ought to do this right. Let's see. This guy's right. That guy's. Uh, Pretty good. The, actually, you know, the, the real rule of thumb with, oh man, this thing's smoking. <laughs> Overload. I, it may be that having the, have, I've got too many light bulbs plugged into it. So I'm going to take, I'm going to pretend this guy still works. It, you know, it's, it's melted wax getting hotter and hotter. Um, a, a, a rule of thumb working electricity, which, I'm, which I was violating up until now and now I'm doing it, is to put one hand in your pocket while you're doing stuff. Why is that? Is because if you accidentally complete a circuit, electricity will go through you. And the worst way in which electricity, the way in which you most do not want electric current to flow through you is, is across your arms, through your heart. So putting a hand in, the, in, the, in your pocket reduces the opportunities for you to accidentally complete a circuit. And if you do complete a circuit, it's likely to be, be between your hand and your foot which is less uh, risky, um, which reminds me, uh, well, all, everything reminds me of old stories. Uh, so, so a person who wrote to me years ago about working on, a, on, a, on a, uh, an old-fashioned television, a television in which we, we, the cathode ray tube type televisions, uh, which actually operate, they operate, I've told you before, by, by shooting electrons at the front, front of the screen through an empty space. And it, they shoot them fast and hard. How hard? 25,000 volts hard. So they have a transformer inside that operates at about 25,000 volts. You know, it's not, not like the static generators we've got or this guy, but it's pretty high voltage. Uh, and he was showing somebody the parts in an operating television set, which I guess it was open, the chassis was open. He was using a pencil and he was moving around, pointing with a pencil, and pencils contain a chunk of graphite. That's the lead. Um, and graphite is a, not a wonderful, but a decent conductor of electricity. And he got the, the transformer. He touched the transformer. And the power went into him by way of the transformer into his hand. And it came out his lip to something else. And he was there going, ah! And he was, and he was thinking, he told me this in, the, in an email, so draw the pencil. <laughs> he eventually succeeded in dropping the pencil. But uh, circuits have a funny way of forming by accident. Be careful about how you accidentally form them. OK, this guy's cooled off enough that I'm probably OK. You're now highly enlightened about what are called flyback transformers and old television sets. They bite. OK, so now if this still is all operating, I've got three circuits. 
I have, and this doesn't even count, I have a source of alternating electric power that goes into the primary coil of this transformer at low, as a large current at low voltage. It will uh, transfer its power to a secondary coil with many more turns. Therefore, what will come, go into this second circuit is a small current at, with a big voltage difference, high voltage. That will run as a small current at high voltage through these wires. And wires, if you recall, waste energy in proportion to the square of their current carrying. And they're not going to be carrying very much current. So this will, these wires will suddenly not waste very much power. OK? That circuit ends over here as the primary of, of a step-down transformer. So that's a step-up transformer. This is a step-down. It's going to take in the little current at high voltage in its primary and provide power to a large current at low voltage in its, in its secondary, the, the third circuit, which completes in the light bulb. Three circuits. And they're up here on the drawing. So this, this circuit over here, low voltage, high current, that's the, that's the left side of this transformer. Then the high, high voltage, low current circuit, it's the other side of the transformer and the long wires. And it finishes over here as the many turns in the, in the primary of the second step down transformer. And finally, the last circuit is, is over here. It's the, pro, it's the secondary of this transformer in the light bulb. And now if I turn this on and it doesn't smoke anymore, light bulb lights up. And it's bright. It's getting nearly all the power. These wires, which are now carrying a small current with much bigger voltage difference between them, handle that power without significant loss. I mean, some loss, but not nearly what we were having before. Questions about this arrangement? OK. So this is how, how the electric power grid works. Um, the, you know, we're, this guy's smoking again. <sighs> um, Something's just going bad in it. Uh, you, you, during, the, during these storms and stuff like that, you, transformers get knocked out periodically. This, this is, they don't live forever, and they have trouble. But uh, just to describe this system, you know, this is my source of electric power. For the power company, the, the source of electric power are, are generators, typically powered by steam. And the issue is, where did the steam come from? It can, be, it can come from burning coal or natural gas, or it can come from a solar concentrators. Uh, it can come from nuclear power. Anything that, that will boil steam will, will operate a, the, a steam engine, in effect, but, but a sophisticated one, a turbine-based one, that will generate electric power, and it will generate alternating electric power. And it does that by moving magnets in your coils of wire. And it moves the magnet rhythmically past the coil of wire, in, out, in, out, in, out. It makes the current go first one way, back and forth, and back and forth. And those turbines and stuff, they're all turning in perfect sync across the entire country. Um, they're all producing the same 60 cycle electric power. And they're literally synchronized with each other. You can count the turns for, for 20 years, and there'll be the same number of turns. Rotations. They're just ticking off like clocks. Yeah, it, it, anybody who's, whose turbine goes too fast will actually provide more power than they, can, than, than they want, and it will naturally slow down. And if the turbine turns a little too slowly, it will provide a little less power than uh, was intended. And in fact, it will begin to consume power, and it will be turned electromagnetically by the, as a motor. I showed you the other day the two, the two, tur the two generators talking to each other. One, one axis is a generator, the other axis is a motor. Whichever one you do work on. Uh, becomes the generator. In any case, the, the power generation system does the same thing. They all turn in perfect sync. Um, and they produce basically medium voltage with medium current. These are actually, it's actually pretty substantial voltage, and it's a humongous current. But, but we're talking about, about a, a, a 100 megawatt generator. They're, that's a lot of current and a lot of voltage. But they still go through a step up transformer to in, further increase the voltage. To, the, to just astronomical values that no one wants to handle, so you put them on high wires, out of sight, out of, no, not out of sight, out of touch. Uh, you send them as, as, you reduce the current, send them across country as a very high voltage, modest current, and then when you get into a city, you go through a step down transformer to transfer power to, to circuits that go through the community at, 
at, at tolerable voltages. You don't, want a, you don't want half a million volts floating around a community, so you go down to 50,000 volts. And the current goes up, the waste in the wire per, per meter goes up, but who cares? You're, it's, it's small, you're working in a community. And you can further keep going through transformers until you go to your house. And so I hope you will sort of recognize these devices as you walk around and you look at the power poles, you'll see the big cylindrical, you know, the trash can shaped transformers that are up there. They're moving power from a high voltage wires to lower voltage wires and getting them into your house and stuff like that. Any questions about this stuff? Why it's there? It is possible during your lifetimes that this alternating current electric power system will evolve and change because um, it was designed in the era before electronic switches were any good or even existed. And now modern electronics has, got, has just gotten so sophisticated that it, that it is possible to move power from a direct current electrical system to another direct current electrical system. Their transformers still involved, but they, but they create alternating current and then they get rid of it electronically. So they're, they're, uh, they can potentially start moving electric power around DC instead of AC. Um, why is that an advantage? Well, the pulsing nature of, of AC is a nuisance in part because there, there are moments of no power. And also, the voltage excursions exceed the, the, effect, the nominal value. So these wires, the, the, the voltage coming out of electric outlet, uh, there are moments in which it's more than 120 volts. It's 170, right? And that, those, those excursions test the limits of all the insulators and stuff like that. So it would be nice if, if you could really deliver 120 volts DC, you wouldn't have to make everything capable of handling almost 200 volts. You'd never be there. It would always be 120. It would never be up at 170. There are no moments like that. So the, 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 the transmission efficiencies of the wires gets better. So uh, you, may see, you may start seeing DC power delivery in your lifetime. Anyway, long rant, rants and rays. The last thing, I'll just to remind you of this, just because it's fun, but... So this is a transformer. It's, it's, it's known as a Tesla coil, and it, it dates back to Nikola Tesla, who, 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 who together with George Westinghouse basically created our electric power grid. And so he's all about it. he was all about AC and electric power transfer. This transformer system, it consists of two primary coils, secondary coil. The primary coil is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight turns of thick copper down here at the bottom. The secondary coil consists of probably about uh, 1,000 turns of very, very thin copper. They're, they're, they're insulated from one another by, with varnish. It doesn't even look like they're insulated, but, they're, but they are. And the, transfer, the, the secondary coil has the end of its here. This, ter this is the end terminal up here. The base has, an, has its own terminal. It's, this, it's a wire down here. It's connected to the ground, to the earth. And this transformer has, no iron, transformer has no iron. These two coils do share the same electromagnetic environment by virtue of being wrapped around the same turf. Um, they share, there's no iron in there. Putting iron in there would, would, uh, there, it would the sparks would go to the iron. It would be a mess. It's, gonna be, it's high, very high voltage. So it's, it's what's called an air core transformer. Um, without iron, there's, there's sort of, it's hard to work with elect electromagnetic stuff without, without iron or something to sort of amplify or, or uh, strengthen the magnetic fields that are around. So, so these transformers that don't have iron in them typically uh, struggle to move power from one, one coil to the other. A solution to that is to increase the frequency of the alternating current. So instead of 60 cycle like we have in our power line, these things operate, this operates probably a million cycles per second. And how do they get a million cycles per second? So, so basically, it's, it's fluctuating so fast back and forth that, that there's not a lot of time to worry about whether the, 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 trying to, to store, build a big magnetic field in iron. You can just, you can briefly create it in the air. It's, I, I'm, I'm, that's a little too hand wavy, even for my taste. But okay, it operates at high frequency. How do you make high frequency in this? Well, it turns out you can do that with the help of, it's, it's a resonance system uh, called a tank circuit, which we're about to come to. This has a tank circuit in it, which consists of a, of a, of a coil of wire, which is elect, an electromagnet that's given a different name. It's called, a, it's called an inductor. And I, I'll, I clearly not get to it today. Um, 
and a sto an energy storage device or charge storage device, it's, it's both, called a capacitor. I showed you a capacitor way early in the class when I made that big spark, that, that huge wampin spark with a screwdriver. That's a device that stores electric charge, positive on one, one surface, negative on the other, and with that, it stores energy. The, the main point is, this has a system in there that synthesizes alternating current at very high frequency and runs, back, runs current back and forth in this coil. This coil is actually the electromagnet of that circuit. And it is able to move power then from the primary to the secondary. And because the secondary has so many more turns than the primary, the voltage rise in that secondary is way more than the voltage drop in the primary. Even so, the voltage drop in the primary is something like 12,000 volts, because it's operated off a neon sign transformer, which is itself a step up transformer. So this is actually two transformers. They, trans they take power from the electric company. They already move it through a transformer to get dangerously high voltage. And I know from past experience as a kid, I had neon sign transformer in my own Tesla coil, and, it, and it, I got the worst bite I ever got uh, from that transformer. Um, so it's already dangerously high voltage. And then they step it up again by way of this air core Tesla coil. So when I turn it on, because you know, I might as well turn it on, right? Uh, part, of, part of the, the getting that resonant circuit going, giving it the kick to get, the, to get the, the charge sloshing back and forth and the current fluctuating, they use a spark gap, which, which, you're, which is what you're hearing. That it, it could be silent if it were not for that stupid spark gap. Uh, there are electronic alternatives to the spark gap, but they all self-destruct after a while. And so Allen gang, um, they have them. They're silent, which is cool but they self-destruct after a very short period of time, which is not very cool. So this guy is robust as can be, and it makes incredibly high voltage, as you see. Okay, you got an idea why this works and how it works? All right, um, yeah, what else? That's about it. Um, yeah, call it a day, happy Friday, and see you on Monday. <laughs>